Welcome to One Planet Conservation Awareness. And today we're going to be talking about how we can help nature and how nature can help us. And we're joined by, for many of you, what would be a familiar face, Megan McCubbin, a zoologist, broadcaster, and now an author of her brand new book, Back to Nature. So Megan, thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure. Can you start by giving us a bit of an insight into how you began to work in conservation and how you've sort of fallen into the field of natural history? Well, for me, kind of working with animals was always kind of part and parcel of my childhood growing up. Um, I grew up with Chris Packham. He's my stepdad. I met him when I was two years old. And from that point onwards, he would try to show me everything about the world. Um, so we would spend a lot of time at the local zoo, which was Marwell. I fell in love with a um, a porcupine there called Vicar, who I would adopt on a regular basis. Um, our downstairs bathroom was filled with rehabilitating animals. So we had barn owls, we had kind of all these different hawks in there, uh, snakes at times, lots of different things. And my bedroom was filled, you know, not with Barbies or kind of dolls houses, but I had skulls and squirrel tails and um, kind of bits and pieces of animals that he would collect and bring back or I would find along the route. So for me, kind of growing up in and around wildlife is just kind of what, what I did, you know, um, and I just kind of absolutely fell in love with it it's really hard not to when you're around someone like Chris who's incredibly infectious with his appetite for knowledge and the science and to understand everything better and to make the world a better place it's kind of hard not to fall in love with it as well so I started off kind of getting a respect and understanding for animals really early on um, I wasn't sure whether I would go into study zoology or not I always kind of thought it'd be part of my life but I wasn't exactly sure how it would form um, cause I, I'm dyslexic and I always really struggled with science and maths. I found it really, really tricky and I still do. So I didn't know whether I could do it. Um, until I kind of met an amazing kind of teacher and found my feet with it a little bit. And then I decided to drop everything else and just go for what I wanted, which was to be a zoologist. So I started working really hard at kind of my science and maths. I'm still really rubbish at it. So please don't go asking me my times tables cause it's, uh, we'll be here all night. And, um, yeah, so it kind of all snowballed from there and I tried to get as much practical experience as I possibly could. I'd volunteer at wildlife hospitals and um, I did internships wherever I could and I kind of built up a specialty. So I started working particularly in predatory behaviour. So I worked with um, a lot of kind of sharks and uh, bears as well and um, also spent a lot of time at the Wild Heart Trust, which was formerly known as the Isle of Wight Zoo, which rescues ex-circus animals and ex-petrade animals, so a lot of tigers. And yeah, so I formed a kind of a relationship with those tigers and spent all my summers, all my weekends chatting and chuffing to tigers. And um, it kind of grew from there, really. And I never kind of thought I'd go into presenting as such. It's just kind of happened naturally, which has been really great fun. I've really enjoyed it. So it sounds like you've had quite an adventure with conservation and had quite a lot of experiences, but you've gone from working with tigers and bears and, and sharks to being stuck in the new forest with Chris. <laughs> with self isolating bird club which actually has absolutely taken off and I think for many been an absolute joy during lockdown so could you tell us a little bit about what the self isolated bird club is how it started and, and how it's got so big yeah I don't think either Chris or I imagined it would ever get as big as it's got it's um been the most amazing response from everybody who's watched it and we're incredibly grateful for everyone's reaction it kind of started because as the kind of first lockdown started and the days were you know longer and it was bright and beautiful and the flowers were starting to spring up we kind of recognized how lucky we were to live in the new forest which is an amazing place in the uk for biodiversity you know it has such a different variation in habitat types and you can see loads of different things so we started kind of really looking at our environment because it's really rare that um, both of us are in the same place for a really long time often we'll be kind of working and going to and from up to London or you know traveling around and, and, and kind of going to meetings and things but everything started happening on Zoom which means we got time to explore our local patch and stay in there for a really prolonged period and sp see spring unfold so we recognized how important that was for us and our mental health and I think one day the, um, the Celandines came out for the first time and Chris thought to himself you know this is 
amazing thing. It's giving him a lot of comfort and it would probably give a lot more people comfort too because not everyone has access to gardens and they might be able to get to green spaces, but they might not be too big or might not have too much biodiversity in them. So he just decided to stream it live on Facebook and just talk a little bit about the biology of the flower um, and showcase its beauty to hope, kind of give people a bit of comfort. And then it started snowballing from there, really. He started doing them every day and um, he ended up having to go to work. So I took over. And uh, I remember being really nervous at the time because it was quite a few thousand people watching. Um, now it seems silly. Now we've gone on to do Spring Watch and Autumn Watch. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of evolved really quickly. So yeah, towards the end, we, well, we've got Fabian Harrison on board, who's the absolute tech genius. He is one of the driving forces of the South Isle Sydney Bird Club. Absolutely brilliant. Kate Crocker as well, who did all the social media managing for it. Um, and the four of us together were able to kind of live stream across the world, um, bring in live guests from around the world too, and live cameras to see what wildlife was doing in different countries. And I think for people it kind of connected everyone when there was so much disconnect. Everyone kind of found friendships and respite in one another and a shared interest for natural history, whether that's something they'd liked before or whether that was something they just found out. So it just built up into this amazing community with so many people talking and great characters. Vix the Fox was a regular. Um, and all these amazing kind of stories just came out and people really supported one another. So yeah, it was a fantastic thing to see it evolve and continue into what it is now, which is really exciting. I think the thing I most enjoyed from following you guys with the South Acid, Acid Bird Club was seeing how different people were able to connect with nature in lockdown. I was actually in a very similar place um, to you in, in Bournemouth and had the new forest to explore and the beach. And I was more concentrated on the reptiles. I was trying to see all of the UK's reptiles and I was able to, really lucky to be able to. Um, but to, but to see all, all the people sending in their, their videos and photos of all the different wildlife, whether it's animals, plants that they could see across the UK, I think for many people, it broadened their horizons of what the UK actually has to offer. Yeah, I think you got a snapshot of what was going on, not just in your own garden, but in everybody's gardens or everyone's local green area. Um, and it just kind of brought a bit of diversity into it. You know, if you don't have foxes in your garden, then you can go onto SIBC and there'll be fantastic photographs of foxes in other people's gardens. And you can kind of connect with wildlife that way. And I think people kind of, oh, I learned a lot. Every day I scrolled through there, I was seeing new things all the time and new facts. And so it was this kind of um, respite, I think, from kind of the horrors that were going on and as you know, are still are going on. And it kind of gave a bit of escapism, I think, for people. You could get so invested in the Facebook group page that we created, like you could just go deep into all these posts and see the most amazing things. Um, and I think people just found a lot of comfort in that because they could just forget about what was going on outside and just kind of focus on wildlife and nature. You know, we had Michaela Strachan from South Africa. We had Yola Williams in Wales. We had penguins in New Zealand. We had all this kind of stuff. So you really got a snapshot, not just what was going on around the UK, but the world too. And I think that was kind of part of the fun of it. Yeah, I think as we lost our, you know, personal communities around us, it actually opened up the opportunity for these online communities of and giving people access you might not have had access or know how to access you know nature and conservation research you know all this knowledge that was out there i think it's actually grown a community yeah yeah now, obviously yeah. it hasn't been all you know doom and gloom in um coronavirus for you guys because it's actually given you an opportunity to write your first book as well <laughs> back to nature yeah so, would you like to tell us a little bit about this book yeah, I've got it, I've got it here. When you told me you, you wrote it in a month, which is very impressive. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the idea of the, of the book and why you guys are so proud of it? Well, it kind of came off the back of South Isolating Bird Club. Um, and we just finished Spring Watch at the time and we got approached by our publishers, Two Roads, who are a fantastic group of people. Um, and they suggested, you know, why don't we write kind of a book about kind of COVID and your connection with nature, a little bit about SIBC. Um, and we were really excited by that idea, um, but we wanted to make sure that the book had a purpose. It was going to serve kind of a function and um, hopefully motivate and empower people to make a difference for wildlife. Because, you know, ultimately throughout the course of lockdown, we would found comfort in it, but it's ultimately struggling. And we wanted people to kind of act for it, um, you know, not just rely on it. 
So we created this book. It's kind of a, a self guided book. It starts off quite localized about what you can do in your immediate environment, what you can do in your gardens and your communities um, to make you know it better for wildlife. We talk a bit about ponds, but it's not just about you know how to dig a pond. It's also about the science, about why freshwater habitats are important. Um, and so it's kind of stories as well about local community groups who have grouped together. Um, for example, Isle of Wight Trust, um, Hampshire and Isle of Hampshire and Isle of Wight Wildlife Trust have done this most amazing initiative called Wilder Streets and they've created streets in Portsmouth and other cities which are kind of un unified and they're all doing something for nature so they've got kind of seed banks where they're swapping with their neighbours and they've all got hedgehog highways and so we write about those kind of things and then we explore the bigger concepts as well there's a lot in it um, we talk about the issues, you know, we talk about wildlife crime, we don't like to shy away from it, we want to start those conversations up, you know, you don't always have to agree with us, but it's important that these conversations are had and those facts are out there. Um, we also talk about rewilding, we talk about reintroductions, we talk about the beaver, of course, the bison, which would be really exciting into the UK. Um, and then we talk about the bigger things, you know, politics and activism. And I think the whole book is kind of an activist book. Now, when people say, you know, oh, you're an activist, you know, initially I was a bit like, well, I, I, that, that word is always kind of looked down on. Now I kind of wear it with a badge of honour because I think the word activist, we should be kind of really changing what that means to people. Because ultimately, from my perspective, if you are a wildlife gardener, if you put lavender in your garden for bees, if you feed the birds, if you go out and feed the ducks, you know, you're essentially an activist, you're active within that environmental community. Uh, and therefore you're doing something which is going to have a positive beneficial effect. So, you know, whether you want to go on a march in London with placards and shout and sing or dance, whatever, that's fantastic. But activism means different things to different people. Um, and I think that's what we should be looking at. And that's exactly what this book says, you know, whatever you can do, if you can wake up tomorrow and do something different that's going to benefit your environment, then that's a positive. So we touch on a lot of different topics. There's lots of science in there. There's also some nice bits as well. It's not all kind of hard hitting. There's some kind of like jewels in there of amazing, mind blowing scientific facts that are kind of standalone pieces. So it kind of gives us the issues. We talk about the solutions most importantly, um, and we kind of just try and remind people why we love nature in the first place. I think when we, when we're talking about conservation and writing about nature and how how we need to protect it. It's very difficult to balance the positive and the negative, but obviously you can't shy shy over and move move over, you know, the big issues. Um, no. Obviously, you have to focus on the solutions and give people hope of how they can how they can rectify this. But what are some of the biggest issues that you think um, are the biggest concern at the moment in the UK? What are the things closest to your heart that you you would like to see people, you know? making some action on oh there's quite a lot of things that are, that are going on <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think one of the biggest issues that we've got generally in terms of contemporary conservation is that fewer people in the uk own less land than anywhere else in europe land is incredibly expensive to buy um, and often when you have land it's been in your family for generations um, and it's not always managed to the best of its ecological capabilities um, and that is a huge issue when it comes to kind of conservation projects like rewilding or reintroductions, you know, because there isn't simply the land that's free to do this because it's all in kind of big family estates. Um, and that poses, you know, a lot of different issues, you know, raptor persecution is one of them. Um, you know, the things I've said, the beaver reintroduction, all of this kind of stuff, it, it makes it really challenging. So that's something which is quite a big issue and quite, you know, it can be kind of complicated to sort out. There is the Langham Moor community buyout, which is something that was really exciting recently. It's an area up in Scotland. Um, I think it's 25,000 hectares big. And a commu the community of Langham have just bought it off of the estate. And their plan is to totally rewild this area. It was a driven grouse moor. It had really unproductive monoculture of heather. Um, and now they've, they're planning on turning it into something wonderful with broadleaf woodland and peatland restoration and you know, it's going to be really exciting. I'm really excited just talking about it. So those kind of community projects, I think, are really powerful. Um, other issues, of course, you know, HS2, absolute disaster from my perspective. You know, over 100 ancient woodlands destroyed. Ancient woodland isn't something you can simply put a few acorns in the ground and grow back in a few years. You know, it's the chances of an acorn turning into an ancient tree are just minuscule. And, and the idea of putting them all down and planting a few trees just to kind of compensate for me is just almost insulting 
in a way, you know, it's going through sites of special scientific interest, it's destroying, you know, endangered species habitat, it's just, you know, all for 20 minutes shorter train journey, it just doesn't make sense to me, and that's not even going into the economical kind of argument for it, which is also awful. And um, we've got Sizewell C, which is a nuclear power station that's going up potentially if it gets approved um, next to the RSPB Minsmere, which is one of the, well, it's the jewel of biodiversity in the UK. It's one of the most fantastic reserves and they might put a nuclear power plant. In. So there's a lot of, <laughs> I could go on about the issues for a really long time, you know, there's, the persecution is obviously really rife as well. And there's lots of things that we need to do, you know, we need to support our local farmers to, and, and not kind of get all this kind of meat and fruit and veg from overseas. We, that can be really beneficial, you know, know where your pounds are going um, and, and kind of just, you know, use your garden space as widely as you can. And also just talk to one another, talk to your MP, write a letter, you know, uh, and, and kind of let, let everyone know where you stand on these kind of issues because there's a lot of them, but we do have the solutions. That's the thing, we've got the solutions to put them right. You know, I know I've just gone on there about a whole load of issues. Um, but we do have the capability to sort it out, but we just need to kind of be vocal about it in a democratic, peaceful way um, and, and kind of get on with it. Absolutely. I think it's very easy for people in the UK, and I often find this, to point the finger at places, you know, like China, America, South America with the deforestation, habitat loss, you know, building railways. But it's actually happening right here in our own backyard as well. But we're in a lucky position where, you know, we, a lot of us have the time, have some disposable income to actually start making a difference. And I do think there is a positive movement at the moment. And you, you touched on it and you got pretty excited about it. Or the, the buzzword in conservation seems to be rewilding at the moment. And specifically going through lockdown, there was some amazing stuff coming out of Isabella Tree's work, the, the beavers in Exmoor and Cornwall. Um, and I really think the rewilding push can make a, a huge difference. Um, and you talked before, and I know it's in your book about how, you know, people can rewild just their garden or their windowsills. It doesn't have to be a large area. So that, that brings on how, what would you say is the easiest way for people to start making a difference on the UK's nature and biodiversity? What would be the first step, would you say? Um, I would say start off locally, you know, start off in your garden, um, you know, put in a pond, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, it could just be a sunken washing up bowl, um, that can still really help, you know, we've lost a massive amount of our freshwater habitat and that really increases biodiversity massively, you know, you get your toads, your frogs, everything coming in, um, just make sure you put some kind of native if possible plants in there um, and a little ramp so animals that get in there can crawl out if they need to. Um, so that's always a really good, but another really simple one to do is to put in you know hedgehog highways I mean I say hedgehog highway but they're great for all kinds of animals you know because our gardens we've got more area in our gardens than all of our national reserves in the UK so collectively we've got a lot of land that we can make better for wildlife and um, it's just we've got to connect them up because the problem with putting fences in is that you stop animals from um, moving between different areas they can't get to new resources they can't find mates and it causes a lot of problems so just putting a little kind of whole hedgehog size you know I think it's about 16 centimeters by 12 centimeters makes a big big difference and encourage things in you know feed the birds all great steps forward um, and then the other thing I'd say to do is just contact your MP you know be aware of what's going on look up the issues um, and if there's anything that you're concerned about don't be afraid to share it on social media you know that goes a really long way because you're adding to the conversation and um, or, or write in a letter and and just you know use your voice because it does matter every person counts I think something you mentioned about you know what you guys were able to achieve in lockdown building a community I think quite a lot of the times people that do start to become conscious about these issues can quite often feel isolated and feel like it's just them doing the hard work but I think it's becoming more and more apparent that actually you're not alone. And if you do reach out, there's so many small, large, you know, medium community groups you can get involved with if your local council, your local schools, all around the country, and in fact the world, the little pockets of community activism um, coming together. So how would you encourage people to be able to find, you know, their place in making a difference? 
Um, I'd say, you know, it's a good place to start is always online. You know, there's amazing, you know, there's an incredible community of kind of young naturalists on Twitter, which is really fantastic. And everyone's very friendly. So you kind of get in contact with them. Um, you know, but there's so much, so many resources online that you can find about what's going on in your local area. Um, you know, if you if you don't really like the Internet very much, then go out to your local nature reserve, you know, see if you can volunteer there, you know, volunteer for the RSPB or volunteer at a wildlife hospital. You kind of then become... Um, aware of what's going on in your local community and aware of the groups and the things that you can do and it is a really supportive place you know how getting involved with wildlife spending time outdoors massively improves our mental health and right now we need that more than ever you know we're in lockdown number two it's dark and it's colder and that's going to have really severe impacts I think on a lot of people and um, much more so perhaps in the first one I'm not sure but I think just by spending time outdoors and engaging with other people who are like minded, you know, whether that's SIBC or whether that is, you know, volunteering somewhere, if it's safe to do so, of course, under restrictions um, and just kind of becoming active, you know, get out with the binoculars. The best thing that I can encourage people to do is just go out and sit there and just watch what goes on, because you find as you're walking through places, you might not notice things but as you sit down, you find that the trees come alive with everything and that's the best way that you learn um, and then you might engage with another bird watcher down down the street obviously two meter distance and, and be safe but yeah i just encourage people to kind of get online go out to their nature reserves and ask what's going on and how they can get involved because there are so many things everyone can do yeah i think people need to realize that wherever they are they can always find nature I came from Bournemouth near you, and as we've already talked about, we were very lucky during lockdown number one to be able to have access to all this amazing nature. But now I'm living in London, and at first my family and friends were worried that I wasn't going to be able to, you know, connect with nature. But actually, every weekend I'm out into parks, and as my girlfriend's watching the sausage dogs go by, I'm <laughs> looking at the birds, you know, looking in the trees. Um, there's some beautiful wetlands around and small parks. So even, you know, in London, in the big city, you can still connect with nature. Yeah. And you mentioned how it, you know, people, you know, in the summer, it's easy to go outside because you don't want to be stuck inside. But you know, as we're very much in winter now and it's getting dark, it's getting cold. What are some tips of how people can still engage with with nature during the, the British winter? I think it's kind of this illusion that, you know, wildlife kind of disappears or goes to sleep in wintertime and there's not much going on. And I find it actually to be the opposite. For me, it's kind of one of the most exciting times for wildlife because I feel like it's all just gone through the craziness of breeding. Everything's been really mad and everything's just kind of like taking a breather. It's relaxing, but it is still there and it's still really active and things the cycle is starting to pick up again. So, you know, you've just got to kind of get up, put your boots on, wrap up warm, get an extra jumper, get an extra scarf on. Um, and if you're able to kind of get out and, and just experience it, like, it, you won't regret it because it is some of the most beautiful times of the year with the fog or the mist and the sunrises are absolutely stunning. Um, you know, so just to go and, and watch, if you know an area where there is particular wildlife around, um, you know, you can go and see wading birds. This is a really good time of the year to go and see wading birds. Um, and, and yeah, just go out and see it. You might see mixed flocks around because in winter often species of birds mix together. Um, and that's kind of an unusual sight. Starling murmurations. I mean, come on, that is incredible. <laughs> I get really excited about that. I haven't seen one this year, but it's, um, you know, hopeful to see what happens depending on lockdown. But, you know, there's so many great spectacles to be out to go and witness. You just got to wrap up a bit warmer. And I'm sure if people, you know, start following the self-isolated bird club as well, there'll be tons, tons more tips. Um, so how can people, you know, follow and find more information about what you're doing? So if you go onto Facebook and just type in South Isolating Bird Club, you'll see a group there. Um, like, like it, get involved in it, comment. It's a really amazing community. Lots of great ideas and art and music and uh, great tips as well. So that's a great way to go and find out where and when what's going on. Um, otherwise, you can follow me on Twitter. My name's Megan McCubbin and I post quite regularly about what, what we're up to. Um, but yeah, kind of tune in to our South Isolating Bird Club broadcast. Uh, at the moment, they're every Sunday at 6 p.m. Um, and we kind of try and get together lots of different kind of conservation stories. There's lots of different films. We've got Luke Massey, who's a fantastic photographer in Spain. Last week, he was talking about fire salamanders. Um, and we get all these kind of wildlife from around the world. We were looking at the albatross in New Zealand last week um, on a live camera, which was pretty exciting. Very so cool. yeah, join in. 
And for those that are still wondering what to get their parents or their children for Christmas, do you want to hold it up one more time and tell us why people should go out and buy your book? I'm all for plugging my own work. I really, I say this. This, this is, is um, for a good cause. This is plugging a good cause, linking people to nature. It's true. There's lots of kind of practical solutions and advice in here about what you can do to make your kind of environment more green, your gardens and how you can connect with your local communities. Some of the issues, but a lot of the solutions too. So, you know, nature's been there for us, we need to be there for it. And on the next one, your name's going to be on top, right? You know what? I did quite query that, but yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll wait for the next lockdown and see what volume two has to offer. Oh no, two books in a year. <laughs> My my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm sure people will go on and check out the Self Isolated Bird Club and also think about buying your book for their loved ones, as I'm sure most people should do. So, Megan, thank you for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. And we hope you enjoy the rest of lockdown and manage to get out and keep enjoying nature. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.